wonderful feeling. It's wonderful to be able to wear this green, and I wear it every day, and uh, I'm very proud. And we're proud of you, Richard, aren't we, ladies and gentlemen? Yeah, my guess, my guess is that Kenny is the youngest of, of this whole regime of, of referees. <laughs> yes, he's the youngest. You know, he was the hardest guy ever taught. No, I <laughs> I, I play with this guy, you know, he's like my son, you know, but uh, he was one of the, to see, you know, after you work with a person for so long and to see them reach the plateau, to reach the top, you know, as you once was, I mean, it's a blessing. I thank God each and every day that he allowed me to be a part of his career. Yeah, and, and Kenny, I, uh, before you actually address everybody, I wanted, because Richard was speaking about being you know, in the Hall of Fame now, but Kenny had an accolade uh, bestowed upon him also uh, into the Hall of Fame, into the uh, uh, Nevada Hall of Fame. And if you could tell us a little bit about that, because my point was he's the youngest, but you can see he's climbing towards, obviously, a, a Hall of Fame career as well. But, but Kenny received uh, Hall of Fame honors uh, this past year. Uh, first, I would like to, um, I'm just thankful to God to be here. I, uh, the first time I came to Canasota, Canasota was in 09. And when I came, I fell in love with the place. Just fell in love with it, had a great time. Uh, the, the people here in this town, they, they just know how to treat you. They, they, they ought to put in the bed on as well with Ed Brophy, but um, uh, last year I got inducted into the uh, into the second class of the Nevada Boxing Hall of Fame, along with my mentor, the best referee of all time, Richard Steele. Let's give him a hand. When, when I first got started as a referee, I asked Richard, would he mentor me? And without hesitation, he said yes. Richard took me to the Golden Gloves gym. He got me in the ring. We started working out. Uh, uh, I, I'll never forget my first day in the ring. There was a, a group of fighters were amateur fighters were fighting, and all of a sudden, one of the fighters, a, a trickle of blood started coming down the side of his face. And they stopped around, and Richard looked at me and said, what happened? I said, I don't know. And he said, that's your first true test right there. You, we have to know if it was a headbutt. We have to know if it was caused by a punch, et cetera, et cetera. And from that point on, my attention just really rose up a notch because we're in the position where we have to know what happened, regardless to if it was an unintentional foul or foul or whatever. But from that point on, I uh, took what I did seriously as far as uh, being a referee. And um, as, as time progressed, um, I got better and better at, uh, at my, my craft. And um, I'm, I'm, like I said before I started, I am just blessed uh, to be in Las Vegas to have refereed some of the, some of the big super fights. Uh, my first super fight was De La Hoya and uh, Bernard Hopkins. And uh, after that, it just took off. And, as a lot of you know, just recently I did the uh, Mayweather Pacquiao, and that was just for me. It just was like over the top. But but um, from the time that I did the the uh, De La Hoya uh, Bernard Hopkins fight, Richard called me and said, "Do exactly what you've been doing. What you have done in the past has got you where you are." And every major fight, now that was back in 2004, and every major fight that takes place, super fight I'm talking about, Richard will call me and he will say the exact same thing. Continue to do what got you there. And, uh, and I thank Richard for that. And, and Kenny and Richard, I'd like to lead in with that, if, if I may. I, I, again, I know there's mixed reviews on, on the actual fight itself, but uh, we spoke a little bit uh, of what I believe that we should have the conversation uh, because this was 
uh, uh, in, in, in our time, uh, the, the biggest super fight to come along uh, uh, anticipation was there for five years to have the uh, Mayweather-Pacquiao fight. But if, if you can talk a little bit about, well, Kenny had, and, and, and I found this through research, some of you guys I'm sure know it, but Kenny had a real true connection to uh, Mayweather and Pacquiao and uh, referee, uh, I, I should have the statistics, but I think uh, eight Mayweather fights and seven Pacquiao or something like that. It was uh, five Mayweather fights and seven Pacquiao, Pacquiao fights. So he was very connected to both fighters. And uh, uh, Kenny also refereed Floyd Mayweather's first professional fight. So there, there was a, a rooted connection uh, to have the, the, the right referee, I believe, uh, for, the, for the big fight. But if you can talk a little bit about, like you said, pre-fight talking to Richard, but how you prepared uh, knowing that this fight was coming together and, and what was going on in, in your mind uh, uh, from your point of view as opposed to the fighter's point of view. Preparation for the Mayweather and Pacquiao fight, I won't say it was easy, but, but for me, like Joey said, I did Mayweather's first professional fight and um, as a referee, I've had the opportunity of watching both fighters grow into the sport. I've had the opportunity to watch both fighters' skills develop as they grow into the sport. And so there wasn't a real issue with me as far as the fight because of the, the number of times I've been in the ring with both fighters, they, they, they never gave me any problems. They both fight clean. Um, they respect my position as a referee, and, and it makes our job easy. Uh, so going into the fight, uh, my anticipation is, was that I wasn't going to have any problems with, with anything intentionally being done by any fighter, or even anything that may relate to, to, to accidental. Now, the only caution that I had was being that Pacquiao is a southpaw, and Mayweather is a conventional fighter. Um, um, Usually what happens is that their lead foot often will, they will step on each other's lead foot. So the key thing for me in that fight was to keep an eye on the lead foot. Um, if a fighter steps on another guy's lead foot and then he hits him and he goes down, now I have to make a call on that. So I want to make sure that I'm in position to catch and see everything because it just takes a split second to be out of position and you can miss a call. Um, uh, as referees, we're not perfect. We make mistakes. I've made mistakes. I've just been blessed over the years to uh, uh, that my work has, has been clean, and uh, part of the reason why I got the assignment was for that very reason. My work has been clean, and and, uh, and, uh, and then the rest is history as far as me getting the assignment. Okay. Kenny, I just want to do a quick follow. -up. You could tell us a little bit about the excitement that was in the building leading up to the to the main event. What kind of energy? I mean, it was great energy, and it, and it was a spectacle, and we can agree to disagree and feel everything about the fight itself, but the, the event itself was one of the biggest events we've had. In, in it was the biggest. It was. The biggest. It was. <laughs> it's supposed to have been the biggest fight ever in history, okay? They try to take my fight away, you know, that's been the greatest fight, you know, but, and that was Agnes Hearns, you know? You remember that, don't you? Okay. <laughs> They try to do me in, you know, but really... That's when the student becomes the teacher. I hey, think. yeah, but, but if they had all the builders, they had everything in line up. They had the fighters, they had... Yeah, I mean, I haven't seen so much excitement. I mean, when I did the Hagelin Hearns and Lennox and all of his fights and everything, the atmosphere in Vegas, I mean, you could feel it in the air. I haven't felt that since this fight here. I mean, it was it was everywhere. Everywhere you go, everybody was talking about the fight. Everywhere you go, the mall, the, you know, everybody was, I guess, you know, you guys been waiting for it for, what, five years. So you was really hopped up. You really plugged in and bought that TV and been rushing home. Y'all probably left work early, you know? To get home to watch this, get a thing set up and everything, and then to let him take care of it. That was just great. 
Well, I tell you, when, when the, um, the commission finally made the announcement that I was being assigned to fight uh, between um, Facebook, texting, voice message, emails, I was probably averaging about 100 calls a day. Just like what you said, the excitement of it. And um, it, it, it kind of tapered off a few weeks before the fight because all the newness of the fight that's going to happen, it kind of wore off. But the day of the fight, now, um, my uh, twin brother has a, has a condo at the MGM in, in the Signature Tower 2. They have three towers, and my brother bought into the second tower a few years ago. I, he was, instead of renting his place out, which he could have done uh, the weekend of the fight, he decided to keep it for himself, uh, which made it easy for me. I didn't have to deal with traffic. I didn't have to deal with the, 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 the crowd leading up to the fight, because I just stayed in his condo. I got a parking pass, so I had to be fighting with people trying to find a parking. It really made it easy. So I was able to get into his condo and just kind of reflect back on the things that I knew I needed to do when I was in the ring and relax. And, and basically that's what I choose to do for any fight, big or small. Just have a time, a, a period of time to myself where I can relax and uh, uh, focus in on what I need to do. And then the, when it was time, I just went down from his condo, down you know the escalator into the, into the arena and um, uh, a lot of people don't know um, a lot of the pre-hype stuff that, that we have to do um, uh, leading up to the fight. And, and one thing, I have to get all the commissioners together. I have to check with, with television because I have to go into the dressing room to do the rules meeting. And, and the television, HBO, Showtime, they want to be there to film it. So I have to coordinate all this stuff prior to going in. Once I go in, go over all the rules, everything is sound and good. Then at that point, I again find a little secluded place for myself to get my mind focused in on, on, on the like, you know the job that I have in front of me, and just wait for the uh, for the for my time to to shine. So, Great. Got some questions. I know everybody's chomping at the bit. Um, Kitty, uh, welcome back. Thank you. One thing that concerned me about the Mayweather Pacquiao fight, and I want to I appreciate John's opinion of this. I thought Mayweather held him excessively, and I was just waiting for you to say something to him to say, hey, look, if you keep this up, I'm going to take a point. It was almost like he hit and hold. And I wanted to get your perspective on it. Well, I didn't feel that his holding was excessive. Because for us, we have to determine how much output as opposed to input. And I felt that there was more output being done as opposed to input. Uh, uh, Mayweather has a style where he does throw a combination or two and then he may grab or clinch. But I, was, I gave the fighters the opportunity to fight out of a clinch, which means that if there's an arm free, you can still punch. If, if I'm not receiving that from both sides, then I'm going to ask for a hard break or I'm going to have to step in and separate the fighters. But, but uh, yeah, I yes, a lot of that, a lot of that is up to the fighter. The other fighter, if he doesn't want to be whole, I mean, he's, he's got to make some kind of gesture or something or, you know, hey, quit holding me. And then that makes the referee have to do something or have to do his job or whatever, okay? But it's up to the fighter. I mean, I've, I have done fights where guys were holding, and the other guy, you know, I thought he liked to be whole. You know? So I'm not going to interfere with his, <laughs> with him again. <laughs> Getting it on, but uh, that's, that's up to the fighter. Come on, you guys. If a guy was holding me, you know, it was just like Marvin Hagler. You couldn't hold Marvin Hagler, you know. He was man. He was twisting, and you know, then that makes the referee have to step in and say, "Hey, you holding? You holding too much? And take a point, and then you know, it makes you act. You know, make the referee do a uh, different job. But if the you know, not one time, not one time did Pacquiao say anything about him holding. 
Did he? No. Not one time. Nor either Freddie Roach say anything to me about hope. And I checked the corners periodically. Freddie Roach never said, hey, Kenny, he's holding it excessively. He right. never said it. Right. He never said it. Question over here, please. Hey, Kenny, how you doing? Um, a lot of people don't know that you should be an inspector before you became a referee. How difficult was the transition for you um, moving on to becoming a referee? And what did you have to do to make yourself better prepared as a referee? Well, believe it or not, I was a amateur referee before I even became an inspector. Uh, uh, doing the inspector's job was just kind of an in-between until I got appointed as a, as a referee. Um, uh, I enjoyed being an inspector um, because it, it, it kept me closer to the fights. Um, I was able to see all the major big fights that Richard was talking about with, with Leonard. Uh, Leonard Hagler, Tommy Hearns, Roberto Duran. I was there at all those fights. So between the, you know my amateur career and then going to the you know the, the, the professional fights, it was a way that I was able to continue to learn the, the, the craft, the art of refereeing. Question right here too. This is a statement actually. This is from Richard. You mentioned getting in trouble for some of your refereeing balls. Well, I saw the. Chavez Taylor fight that you got criticized for stopping like a couple seconds left in the last round. You made the right call, believe me. Because I remember, well, I remember Taylor was, he, he, didn't, he couldn't seriously hurt it and go on. No, so, I so you made the right call. Thank you, I appreciate that. You know, refereeing is something that, that we, we do, Ken and I, we, he's still doing it. But, uh, you know, we couldn't do it without the help. It takes a lot. It takes a lot. You guys don't realize how much it takes to do a job and to do a good job in that ring with, with all these top athletes. But we couldn't have done it without our wives, you know. And so, I mean, really, my wife is here. I see Kenny's wife. We couldn't do it without our wives. They comfort us. They keep us, you know, calm down. and. They do everything, make us, help us to get prepared. So I really want you to know that without our wives, we wouldn't be able to do it. So let's give our wives a hand. Shopping. Question right here. Um, one for each of you guys. Kenny, how did you come up with uh, your catchphrase, what I say you must obey? And Richard, how bad, in a Hagler Hearns fight, how bad was the cut over Marvin's uh, bridge of the nose or eye or wherever it was located? So whoever wants to answer that. Uh, when I first got started, I got appointed to be a professional referee back in 91. And, and Richard was established, Mills Lanes was established. Um, we had a few referees that were very well established. Um, Mills Lane's saying was, let's get it on. Michael Buffer's saying was, let's get ready to rumble. So my my middle son said, Dad, you got to get a you got to get a phrase. <laughs> and I said, No, I don't I don't need to get a phrase. No, no, everybody's got one. You need to get one. And I says, Well, I, you know, I, I I really don't care about a phrase. So um, he thought of a catchphrase, and um, when my sons, me and my wife raised three, three boys, and, and I was the disciplinarian, and, and so the catchphrase that my son came up was, I say it, you obey it. And I says, well, that, that's, that's a little, a little too harsh. <laughs> Maybe we can clean it up a little bit. And then when I cleaned it up, I cleaned it up to what I'd say you must go ahead. And um, I'm also a retired school teacher, so um, I was the same way as a retired school, or as a teacher. I was, uh, I was a disciplinarian, and, and all of it fits. So, so that's where I'm at. And Richard, on the follow-up about Marvin's cut. The cut was, was you know, it was bad, it was a bad cut because it was a lot of blood, okay? But it didn't really worry me because the location of the cut. It was on top of his head, okay? So 
it, that didn't worry me, but at the same time, I wanted to play it safe, and I said, you know, I wanted to get a medical opinion. So I wanted to take him to the doctor to get a medical opinion, and, and uh, uh, Marvin said, I'm not gonna let you stop this fight because of no cut. <laughs> Then he not turns out. <laughs> now, uh, uh, if, if I may, and uh, everyone seems to want to hesitate and kind of jump in into it, but uh, uh, I'd like to, and if you'd like to just comment, we don't have to get in depth on it, but but I think we should. I think it's a, a proper conversation. I, I think there's two sides to the story. I think there's a big picture, and I won't go into my theories, but I think we should talk a, a little bit about the fight. What each of his uh, take was from the from the Mayweather Pacquiao fight. Well, I'll start off and let Kenny finish up because, as I said, you know the fight was built up to be a great fight, and it didn't reach its plateau of being a great fight. But it's a fight that everybody wanted to see. But at the same time, if, if you really be honest with yourself. If you really be honest with yourself and say, hey, we wanted that fight when they was at the top of their game five years ago. You know they wasn't at the top of their game five years later. So you got what you asked for, but what you asked for is not what you wanted. <laughs> what you got? <laughs> I knew going into the fight that two things could happen. And I knew of the two things that could happen because of the style of the fighters. Uh, you got Mayweather that fights more from a defensive posture than from an offensive posture, a posture. And then you got Pacquiao that fights more from an offensive posture than he does from a defensive posture. And um, I knew that and from refereeing both of the fighters as many times as I have, I knew that it was going to either be a blockbuster fight or it could be a, a fight that fans could be somewhat disappointed. I say somewhat because um, for the first five, maybe six rounds with five, it was action packed. It was. And then I felt, and I said this um, uh, to a few fans uh, since I've been here, um, I felt that Pacquiao was, was difficult to hit me with. And I've seen it over and over. Fighters, they get to where they can't hit him, so they pull back. Because it's, it's kind of a, uh, an embarrassment to some fighters if you just keep throwing and you don't land. And he wasn't landing. He was missing. And so his strategy or his pace slowed down, and then that's where the, I guess the boredom came in because people wanted more, and Mayweather chose to fight his game plan. Uh, we also know that Mayweather is a very good counter puncher. He's not gonna go in there and throw five or six combinations and get the crowd all worked up. That's not his style. He's just gonna pick you apart. And that's basically what he did. He just basically picked Pacquiao apart. And um, it's, 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 it's interesting because um, uh, uh, Mayweather as a fighter is, uh, I don't want to use the word hate, but I know he is not the fighter that everyone desires, that like. A lot of people don't even like his style. So they look for things to, to create this air or negativity, negativity uh, about him that, that shouldn't be because you knew going into the fight what his style was. Everybody knew what his style was. He hasn't changed it since the day he's been in the ring. So why should he get in the ring of the biggest fight in, of the century and change it? Does it make sense? Kenny, uh, someone just whispered in my ear too, if you could talk about, was there any point in the fight that you knew of or had the detection that Pacquiao's shoulder was was really injured, or was that something that was just a... I, I was asked that several times after the fight, and 
and I saw nothing. Pacquiao gave it his best. Like I said, after the fifth round, going to the sixth round, I think he slowed down because he was unsuccessful in hitting. But as far as his shoulder, I saw no indication. The times that I went over to his corner, I heard nothing about a shoulder or anything. Anything. I didn't. We get some more questions. I know that's going to spur on some. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to follow up on this gentleman's question about excessive holding, etc. The next week, Vladimir Klitschko fought Brian Jennings, and it looked to me like that referee was doing everything possible to disqualify Vlad, to me. And I think it was some kind of backlash, maybe, to the Mayweather fight. They were overcompensating. I noticed that this vacillates. It goes back and forth from fight to fight. Sometimes they're not tolerating anything. Sometimes they're tolerating a lot of holding. Through the year, or each year, as referees, we attend seminars. And we attend seminars to better educate ourselves to fighters, to better educate ourselves to our craft. Uh, last year, I attended six referee seminars. I was a part of hosting two of them. Now one might say, well, gee whiz, you're at the top of your game. Why do you need to? Because you're never too old to learn. Never. And at one of the seminars, um, which was in, was in Bangkok, Thailand, for a seminar. And, and the discussion of holding came up. Now you mentioned Klitschko. Several months before the fight in Bangkok, Thailand, Klitschko fought this Russian. Oh yeah. And I counted myself. The, the fight went 12 rounds. There was 170 clinches. 170. Now, would one say that's excessive? <laughs> overly, overly, overly excessive. There was never a point deducted. There was some warnings, but there was never a point deducted. Now, there are several types of holes that you have to understand. If a, if a fighter comes in and he dips down, and then the fighter puts his weight on top of you, and and I'm not picking on Klitschko, but because he's 6'7", and a lot of times he's fighting guys that are 6'2", 6'3", uh, maybe 6'4", he has an advantage. He has an advantage because when they come in, he can slip the punch and then just drape his body on it. Now, they put that weight on him to try to tire you out. It's just a common thing. The trainers, they teach it to their fighters to do it. So, in that fight that you're referring to, I don't think it had nothing to do with the Pacquiao and with the fight. Nothing. Klitschko has a habit of doing it. In Nevada, us referees get together, and when a fighter comes to Nevada to fight, if I've had a problem with him, if he has a habit of doing something wrong, if he occasionally goes low, in the dressing room, we're going to caution him about it before he even get in the ring because he has this habit. Or he leans in with his head. I'm going to caution him in the dressing room because when he gets in the ring, I don't want to see it. And then if I see it in the ring, I'm going to respond to it. So I don't know the referee. I, I, I know the referee, Mike Griffith. I don't know if he'd caution him in the dressing room. I don't know. But Clisco has a habit of holding his opponents, draping himself over them to tire them out. He just does. I hope I answered your question. Um, I got one here, then I'll come up. Hi. Um, do you think it would be good for there to be two judges and then the referee judge, or is there too much going on during a fight that you can't? Um... Yes. Would, 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 you, that's, could, that's would the... it be good for two judges and a referee judge also, or? But it's too much going on. But here. still, two judges ain't going to police you. <laughs> you know, two or five or whatever. But here's the thing. 
you know, I was against, 1980 we had a seminar, and no, we had a convention. We had a convention, 1980, WBC. And that's when they brought together, well, see I was brought up as a referee and a judge, okay? So I did that. It's the hardest job on earth. Here you got two knockdowns, you got a guy, got his head split, you got the doctor coming in, you know, and then you get him back to fight again, and then you get another guy, he knocks the other guy down, and uh, okay, and then the bell ring, bang, and then you go to, you sit him to that corner, you go to your corner, you get your, reach in your back pocket, and get your tablet out, your scorecard, and you said, damn, who won that round? <laughs> You don't know who the hell won the round. You've been so busy with knockdowns and cuts and, and you know, hello blows. You don't know who won the round. So I said, oh, I guess I give this one to that guy and I give the next one to the other guy. But that's wrong in, in doing it because it never, it, not, it might not be a next time for the other guy. You see what I'm saying? So that's wrong doing it. You got to know who won the round. But believe me, when they took that away from us, I was against it. Because I said, well, here, I learned doing it this way. I want these guys to learn doing it the same way, you know? But the guy, it's a friend of mine, never goes to dinner, he, he's passed. He told me, he said, Richard, go along with this because it's going to make a better referee out of you. Because all you're going to have to do is to take care of the fight. You're not going to have to worry about who's winning the round. And that was so much that really helped all of us to become better referees, and he was right. And, and when I got started refereeing, they had already made the change where the referee just, you know, takes control and monitor the fight. There was no, no judging, and like Richard said, I'm, I'm I'm, I'm glad that I wasn't put in a position to have to, you know, referee and then score it at the same time, because that's just asking too much. Um, uh, uh, years ago, uh, I guess it was a little easier for, for, for referees because, and I'm talking about back in the 30s and 40s, it was stand-up fighting. Both guys were walking to the center of the ring, and they would just fight. But nowadays, guys are moving, and they back and forth and it's circling and there's a whole lot more going on in that ring like it, like it was before. Um, so like Richard said, it's best that it is to stay in the ring, referee the fighters and leave the judging to the, to the judges. Yeah, and also, you know, as he said years ago, do you know when I first started refereeing, and what they would do for a new referee, they would send you out to look. See, I'm from California. I know this on the other side of the world from here, but I'm from California, so in California, to get you broke in, they would send you out to all these little towns, Bakerfield, San Bernardino, uh, up in Oakland. They'd see all of these little towns, and the little towns, okay, they don't have a lot of money to have three judges and a referee. So to save money, and, and when I first started, they said, okay, Richard, you do all, you hold the winner up. You be the judge and the referee and everything. It was the hardest thing in the world, you know? It was the hardest thing in the world to do. You know, so, you know, it's good that they have it the way they do at the present time, three judges and just the referee to take control, take control of the fight. Well, all, all I know is you guys must have done something wrong because we got a question from Kenny's wife. Oh, wow. I just wanted you to explain, Kenny, when he was asking about holding, um, when you explained to me, like in the Madonna fight, that holding is a perfectly legal tactic as long as you have offense that goes with it. And when you explained that to me, then I, then I got it because I never knew that holding was legal. So I wonder if you could just explain that a little more. During the course of a round, there are things that we look for, that we look, um, we look at. A hole could be a light hole or a strong hole. If it's a light hole, 
we tell the fighters in the dressing room, we give them the opportunity to fight out. That's what we want them to do, is fight out of the clinch. And sometimes, and, and, and there's been issues about us telling fighters what to do. So instead of me saying, fight out, I'll say, work out. Now, work out means that you can fight out, or you can step out, or however way you want. I'm not telling you what to do, but I'm giving you the opportunity to get out whichever way you want. If it's a hard hold, there's no point in trying to give you the trying to get you to work out because I've determined that it's hard. Uh, uh, case in point, when I refereed the Mayweather Madonna fight, um, uh, uh, some of the so-called um, sports announcer experts felt that I didn't give Madonna the opportunity. To, to punch out uh, their attitude, and I'm talking about the Madonna camp, was um, rough him up. Now, I had a couple of things going with me. In the first fight, that's basically what Madonna did in, in, in my observing of the fight. I thought he did some things that, from low blows to head butting and a few things, that when I got the rematch, I just wasn't going to let it happen. And I wasn't going to let it happen. And, but when it, come, when it came to the holding, and like Richard had said earlier and I had said earlier, I have to make the determination. If it's excessive, then I will make, make and I'll let the fighters know. But if it's not taken away from the pace of the fight, the momentum of the fight, then I have to call it the way I see it. And, and uh, in that particular fight, um, I had to uh, call it the way I saw it. Question right up front. Um, let me uh, say thank you to Kenny's wife. That helped uh, clarify for the thank you for, for helping me out in that case. Kenny, um, how do you handle, I've always wondered, like camps sometimes you know, like you said earlier, fighters have certain tendencies, and sometimes their tendencies aren't technically legal, but they don't disrupt the flow of the fight. But how do you handle if you go to the dressing room before the fight, and they point out some things, say, Kenny, I need you to watch. Mayweather likes a stiff arm. You know, he can't do that. How do you balance those kind of requests that are somewhat legitimately based but there are tendencies that the fighter's had his whole career, and he's been doing them. How do you handle that in a big fight so that you don't feel like you're kowtowing to those kind of requests, even though it might be legitimately based? And I also wanted to know, did you get any requests like that in those dressing rooms? Did Mayweather have any, express any concerns about Pacquiao and vice versa? In the dressing rooms, each camp are trying to either create an atmosphere or try to get me to side with what they want. When I go in the ring, I have to side with what I know I have to do. So it's, we call them mind games. So they'll get in and a fighter can say, Oh yeah, hey Ruff, he, he likes to throw a low blow. So he's planted a seed in me to keep an eye out in regards to his opponent throws low blows. And I can go in the other dressing room and they're throwing them back. So now I'm getting in the ring and I got all these seeds thrown at me um, that each fighter has said, or camp has said, that they want me to be mindful of. and. Again, I have to make the call now. In the Mayweather Pacquiao fight, um, uh, there were a few things that the Pacquiao camp had, had brought up in reference uh, to Mayweather. Nothing was serious, but they're just planting seeds. And I've seen, like I said earlier, a, enough of both of them's fights to know what to expect. So, you know, it, it, it usually doesn't alter my thinking. And, and it should not alter my thinking what, what seeds they're planting because um, we call it the way we see it. We don't have time to, to think about it. 
If the heads are coming close, I'll say, watch your heads. I'll just caution them. That's a caution. Watch your heads. Their heads may not never even touch. And I learned this from Richard. But caution them before they touch. Because if you wait till they touch, now you got a decision you have to make. So I'd rather caution them so that it don't happen as opposed to it's happening and now I have to call time out, get the doctor over, if it's before the fourth round, what's the decision is made, it's after the fourth round, what decision are made, and then the list just goes on and on and on. The biggest issue, like I had mentioned earlier, about the Mayweather Pacquiao fight was their lead feet stepping on each other. And if their lead feet step on each other and a guy gets hit and he goes down, what do you do? Do you call it a knockdown or do you say he stepped on his foot and that's why he went down? That's a decision I have to make. Now you can imagine one side is going to argue the decision I make because it's not decision is not going to be in their favor. It's not. Just like when we have to stop a fight, same thing. I'll stop a fight, the other side that didn't want the fight stopped, are ranting and raving because they felt that we shouldn't have uh, uh, stopped the fight. But I want to say this about safety. That is our number one job in the ring is fight safety, those fighters. You can jump up and yell and scream and have a good time during the course of those 12 rounds and when the fight is over with, you get to go home and do your thing. Those fighters, some of them got to go to the hospital, maybe too many punches. The doctor will take their passport and will indicate in there if they can go to the gym and train, the next time they can fight, the doctor puts it in their, pass in, in their passport for their safety. When Richard stopped the Meldrick Taylor uh, Chavez fight, it was for Meldrick Taylor's safety. Now, I did a fight at the Orleans, and I'm, I know I'm getting a little curious, but I want to share this. Absolutely. I did a fight at the Orleans, and in the second round, fighter A hit fighter B, and fighter B went down. He, he didn't uh, catch himself when he hit the canvas. Uh, uh, we call knockdowns in degrees. A flash knockdown is a, uh, is a first degree knockdown. A knockdown that a fighter catches himself and he's still a little shaken, it's a second degree knockdown, and a third degree knockdown is when the fighter just goes down. This fighter went down, third degree knockdown. When I stood over him, I didn't even count. As soon as I saw his eyes going into the back of his head, I knew it was serious. Called time, doctor came in, rushed him off to the hospital. The fighter was suffering from a cerebral hematoma. Bleeding of the brain. They did surgery, they stopped the bleeding, they sewed him back up, the bleeding started, and he died. I didn't know if I wanted the referee anymore. The first call I got was from Richard. Because I didn't know if I wanted the referee anymore. That was too devastating for me. And me and Richard talked, and then I get a call from the executive director, Mark Ratner, and I'm crying on the phone, because I don't know, and Mark says to me, Kenny, the next fight card, you're, you're, you're on the next show. You're on the next show. And I knew then that that was going to be my ultimate test, how I was going to respond in the ring after the death of a fighter on what my career was going to be like from that point on. Either I still had it or I lost it. So um, I, I, I want to share that with you because um, uh, yeah, we all get the enjoyment of two guys in there entertaining us, but the serious nature of it, when we're in there, is safety of the fire. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I think on that note is, is the, the best note to, to leave on uh, as we're going to get ready for our opening ceremony.
But uh, I think uh, uh, the discussion was uh, opened up, and, and who better to uh, start it with uh, today uh, than both Hall of Famer Richard Steele, the professor, and the uh, student, uh, and soon to be Hall of Famer Kenny Bayless. Let's put our hands together for Richard Steele, Kenny Bayless. Great job. Richard.